it was, in a sense, a relief uh, because I graduated from uh, UNC uh, Greensboro in, in May. Uh, I'd interviewed for some jobs and so forth. And uh, back then, it was, I guess, appropriate to ask you what your draft number was. And mine was low enough. It was 116 that um, they, um, a potential employer would say, uh, well, check back with us when you get back uh, from Vietnam. And so being drafted was actually kind of a relief because it put that uh, question uh, to bed, you know. Now I had a job. It just happened to be with the U.S. Army. Basic, where'd you do that? What was that like for you? Uh, basic was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. It was uh, in uh, late October uh, through the end of the year. I did not know that it could get so cold uh, in South Carolina as it did during that period of time. Basically, uh, we were stripped of our personal identity. Uh, you know, that's the purpose of the haircuts and the uniforms and all that uh, to uh, sort of mold us into what uh, they want us to be. And uh, I was not uh, particularly happy ab about all that, but uh, it was just part of the, uh, the regimen, the training that uh, we had to go through. Uh, so um, basic was not a particularly fun time. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. You in Greensboro, the Greensboro Club. You in DG and Yeah, yeah. Didn't leave home much. Uh, no, I, in fact, I lived at home when I was in school. Were you family in with Cone Industries or something? Or the no, my dad was a, a pipe organ builder, and um, I started working with him when I was about six years old, and so uh, I had. Um, some background on that. Interesting thing was, with, uh, I was a music major at UNCG, and so when they had to have a re recital, and something would go wrong with the pipe organ in the recital hall, uh, they would call me out of the audience to go fix it. And uh, fortunately, I had enough uh, uh, knowledge and experience that I could uh, usually do that and save the day, if I might say so. Uh, so the you know the cavalry come comes running in to uh, fix the pipe organ. Uh, they were definitely concerned, uh, and I was too, you know. I, um, yeah, it was the unknown that was the, the scary part of it, and that would apply to my parents as well as myself. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you've probably heard this before because I think it is a, a, a common experience. The, the door opens uh, to um, get off the plane and you're hit with this oppressive heat and uh, um, a stench in the air that I have not smelled either before or since uh, I left Vietnam. And uh, that was kind of my first impression of, of Vietnam. What was, uh, what was service like? Well, I was uh, trained as a radio telephone operator. Uh, I was uh, told that um, along the way that that was uh, um, uh, an area that there was a shortage of RTOs and um, that I was considered non-expendable. So you have expendable personnel and you have non-expendable personnel. So about six weeks after I was told that I was um, non-expendable, I found myself out in the bush uh, as a radio operator, and the radio operator uh, is typically the first target uh, in a firefight. Um, and I'd read in the uh, Vietnam magazine oh, three or four years back that uh, the average life expectancy of an RTO um, in a firefight was 15 seconds. So I'm not sure how I went from non-expendable to it seemed to be the most expendable uh, you know, in, in a period of six weeks. Uh, but I did a lot of different things when I was um, uh, in service in Vietnam, and uh, basically I kind of hated the whole gig. But looking back on it, it was, um, uh, it was an experience that um, I learned a lot about myself, about life, 
uh, and um, uh, don't have any. The only regret that I have, frankly, is that I didn't have a better attitude when I was serving over there. If there's one thing I could go back and change, it would have been my attitude. Uh, the uh, loneliness, I guess, uh, being a little homesick, um, but that was true for, for everybody. So um, you, know, you kind of look around and you see what you're going through, but you know that there have been tens or hundreds, by the time I was there, um, uh, you know, at least two and a half million other guys who've been through the same thing. So if they've done it, you know, I uh, don't see why I could do it. Uh, some of the uh, frustration I had was being a music major at UNCG and a trumpet player. Uh, I had auditioned for the 266 Army Band once I got there and was accepted and uh, had been trying to get into uh, uh, an Army Band uh, to play and I was just frustrated that I had been accepted and then I was told that uh, you know there was a shortage of RTOs and. Uh, they wouldn't release me from the first calf to go to the 266 Army Band. And that went on for, for months, trying to make my path into, um, um, into the band. And I like to say now that the only band that I got to play in was that camouflage band that goes around your helmet. Um, and, um, but uh, I look back on it uh, as being a worthwhile personal experience at this point. <laughs> well, uh, in the bush, uh, uh, silence was pretty much the code. Uh, nobody had uh, radios to play music and so forth. The only radio that we uh, had was the um, uh, Prick 25 or the Prick 77 that we used to communicate with the fire base and uh, so forth. So, um, uh, no, um, music out in the bush was uh, not acceptable. On the fire bases, that was a different story, and I uh, uh, bought a used uh, cassette tape player from someone who was going back to the States um, and had um, my mom send over some um, uh, cassette tapes that I had some favorite jazz um, um, musicians that uh, I had requested. and. Uh, so I enjoyed listening to those. Then I went to the bush and I had to send a lot of my gear back to the rear for safekeeping. Uh, in the process, somebody stole the um, uh, cassette tape player and, uh, and probably threw the tapes away because um, you know, jazz is not particularly mainstream. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, yeah, there was that, that music. And then if, I guess if you went to the EM club, uh, enlisted men's club. Uh, at night, if you were fortunate enough to be in the rear area, uh, you could hear the, you know, the more of the music of the day of the uh, rock music and that sort of thing, which I uh, was not uh, that much of an enthusiast for that kind of music. So, what were some of the good things you really enjoyed about your service? Uh, the downtime, uh, particularly when uh, we were in the jungle and just stopping to fix a meal, whether it be uh, sea rations and the different ways we could doctor that up to um, have a good meal. And um, uh, we also had usually availability of LERPs, uh, long range reconnaissance patrol meals that came in a canvas bag and um, a plastic bag inside the canvas bag and so forth. And uh, sometimes there were uh, larvae that um, were in the, the food, but we just cooked that up. Uh, it was just additional uh, protein. Of course, they were dead, uh, but uh, uh, just the relaxation of sitting down and having the meal and talking with your, your buddies and uh, talking about home and, and that sort of thing um, was one of the more pleasant experiences uh, that I had over there. Can remember any of them? Any specific letters of writing home that stand out in your head, or that you received from home? 
Well, interestingly enough, um, I found early on if you wanted to get letters, you had to write letters. And uh, so I, I wrote uh, a lot, and uh, in fact, I uh, wrote a memoir uh, a few years back, uh, and I was able to go back to those letters because uh, friends and family would send me letters. I would read them a few times, uh, put them in an envelope, address to myself back in the States, send them back home. Uh, my mother kept all the letters that I had written uh, and sent home. So when I uh, sat down to write the memoir, I had about uh, 545 pages of letters that I could go back and sort of uh, set a, a timeline as to where I was, what I was doing, what I was feeling, uh, and so forth, and um, th that re really helped me a lot. Um, one that I remember um, my mother writing was, um, I guess it was the first letter that I got from her. Um, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, and my uh, uh, folks demonstrated their f faith on a daily basis and so forth, and uh, my mother had written uh, that I now understand um, what it means to pray without ceasing for I think about you many times during the day. And uh, then um, the one and only letter that I got from my dad, because uh, she was writing for both of them basically, uh, was when I was sent to the jungle. And that was uh, definitely one of the um, um, points of, of great despair because I was not trained to do that. I was not even supposed to be in the jungle. And so I'd uh, written home, and uh, my dad uh, had uh, written back in his own handwriting and so forth a letter of uh, great encouragement to me. And um, so uh, uh, those were a couple of letters that really stick out that uh, meant a lot to me. And fortunately, I still have those uh, letters. And, uh, you know, I'd, I would say one of the positive things about having been in the war was the fact that you did have this communication going back and forth between family and friends and so forth that uh, under other, uh, I can't think of many other circumstances where you would have that much correspondence that is preserved today that uh, you can go back and uh, see what your, your parents were saying and doing and uh, encouraging you and uh, and then, you know, my own thoughts and feelings about what I was going through. What, when the war ended, what was some of the, what was the welcome home like for you? And, and, and what was it like, I guess, when you first walked back in and got to see your parents again when you got home? Well, that was a wonderful day for sure. Uh, when uh, I left Vietnam, it was actually... Um, uh, leap year, and I left on February the 29th. Uh, we boarded the plane, and for reasons unknown to us, we sat on the tarmac for seven hours before we left. And uh, it was a 25-hour flight, so we were uh, getting a little antsy. Um, so we got back to the to the states, and uh, my recollection uh, is that uh, we went into Travis Air Force Base, that I know for sure, and then we were transported to uh, I believe it's Fort Ord to be debriefed and have our exit physicals and uh, other things that they do. Uh, and after that, uh, we went to our respective airports or where we were going to get our transportation back home. And uh, I was struck by the number of dress greens that uh, I saw in trash cans kind of all over the, uh, the place, you know, where the... Uh, Soldiers coming home, rather than opting to travel in uniform, uh, took off their uniforms, stuffed them in a trash can, put on their civilian clothes, uh, I guess so that they wouldn't be uh, exposed to some of the harsh treatment uh, that uh, they were getting. As far as my own treatment was concerned, um, I didn't experience any of the really bad stuff that uh, you hear, um, and uh, my friends and family were uh, glad to have me home safe and I was glad to be home safe. It was, it was a great day. Have you had any long-term effects from your service? Any health issues from that? Uh, I have. Um, when I got back, I had my uh, eyes checked as a normal um, um, physical, uh, annual 
uh, checkup, and they found a piece of shrapnel in uh, one of my eyes. And uh, over the years, though, apparently it has dissolved because uh, it's, it's no longer there. Um, I had uh, a hearing loss, um, and uh, uh, Agent Orange has been um, a cause um, that has been attributed to, I guess, 80 or more diseases, disorders, and, and cancers, and I uh, have recently uh, had one of the, the cancers and have had it uh, treated. Uh, so those were the, the three longer-term uh, issues that I have had to deal with health-wise. Well, when I first got back and found the shrapnel uh, in my eye, I went to the VA in Winston, and it was unbelievable what you had to do uh, in terms of having uh, medical records, eyewitnesses as to um, uh, the injury, uh, just things that were not possible for me to to go anywhere to get. Um, and so I just kind of gave up on it. I think that was their modus operandi, that they just make things so difficult for you to get benefits that um, you just give up. And that's, that's what I did. And then um, uh, later on, I uh, ran into uh, one of the guys with the Disabled American Veterans, and we were just talking, and he uh, encouraged me to try again. And this, the process is a, a lot simpler now that things are online, and now we have the presumption of certain diseases, disorders, and cancers. Uh, and I thought the process this last time was a lot easier to satisfy their requirements than, than before. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with the presumption and not having to prove um, you know, that the war was a cause of um, whatever the issue might have been. Why is it beneficial for you to be part of those groups and to be out talking to the community about your service? Well, uh, for one thing, you know, we are a band of brothers. Many of us experience similar type things. I would say that the uh, that all of us had unique experiences, particularly um, after we started going over as units and we were basically going over as replacement troops, uh, as individuals, you, you might say. Because uh, when I went to Vietnam, I was on the plane with probably 300 guys, I'm just guessing at that. I didn't know a soul on the plane. And when I uh, came back, I was on the plane with all these other guys that I'd never known before. So, uh, you know, as we were in country doing our, our service, there was just a um, kind of a uh, conveyor belt of new guys uh, coming in as people were being, um, uh, having served their tour, tour of duty. They were going home. We had people wounded, people killed, uh, and new people, new faces coming in to replace those that were leaving for whatever reason. So, um, my experience was that nobody was in the same places, uh, same battles, um, had the same experiences because of those different time frames. Uh, we, we shared some common time frames and battles and that sort of thing, but not in its entirety because we were constantly being moved around. And, and particularly in my position as a radio operator, uh, I was shifted around more than the, the general unit that I was with, whether it be platoon or, or company, they just kind of like to move me around.